Our topic is research ethics and integrity. Uh, as in all pursuits, we must clarify the purpose for our actions. So, this is uh, meant for PhD supervisors basically. So, when we supervise, what is our intention? So, typical intentions are that um, this is my job, and so I should do it. But uh, Islamic intentions are that pursuit of knowledge is a very high, uh, highly prized action. And so the issue is how can we become classified among those people who are pursuing knowledge because those have been uh, told of very high rewards for this action. And also how can, how can we convey this uh, excitement of pursuit of knowledge to our students. So that's uh, very different from a routine job. So coming back to the question of ethics and integrity, uh, the truth is that our academic culture does not teach ethics and integrity and the environment is very hostile to any attempt at ethics and integrity. The atmosphere is very much publish or perish and uh, combined with the ethics of survival of the fittest, it doesn't really leave, leave any room for ethics. How did this come about? Well, that's because basically we are following the academic norms of West. And what happened in the West was that there were more than a century of religious wars between Protestants and Catholics. And the <clears throat> conclusion that the Europeans drew from this is that religion leads to conflict and therefore it should be excluded from public domain. And what that means is that uh, the internal regulation that religion provides that I have to do good because this is what my God tells you to do, this is what will give me rewards of the Akhara and this is what pleases my soul. These things were thrown out and they said no internal norms do not work to create peaceful society because we have seen people with very strong religious beliefs just fighting each other all the time. So what we need to do is to is substitute external norms. External norms, yeah, we have to have rules and regulations and punishments and rewards. And so this was one of the uh, start the one of the fundamental political thinkers Hobbes wrote the Leviathan which is all about how a giant state is needed which looks into all aspects and details of a person's life so that we can get ethics and morality from an external point of view by punishing good uh, uh, bad behavior and rewarding good behavior. So actually this was the wrong lesson that Europeans drew from their historical experience, but we are all suffering the consequences of this today. So also in uh, academic culture today, uh, there is really no room for ethics and integrity. The rules of HEC ensure that everybody is running after publications and running after publications ensures that you cannot pay attention to quality because you will not make up the numbers, either you have the numbers or you have quality. And then, uh, so we have large numbers, low quality, paid publications with 50 co-authors and, uh, and no value added in research. And this is also part of capitalist ethics. Uh, Friedman said very famously that the only business of business is to make profits and there is no social responsibility. So again, we are taught that pursuing money is the only goal. So we see all around us that in 
every institution that I've seen, there's lots of dirty politics. And so we ask, well, why should I be ethical when no one else is? And also, if I try to be ethical, it will cause me a lot of harm. So in this harsh and hostile environment, how can we strive for ethics and integrity? Well, it's because HEC wants us to do so. QEC has made sure that everybody attends, otherwise some action will be taken. And no one is really interested. Actually, why should, I mean, how can I teach you ethics and integrity if you don't have it inside you? Again, this is not really a very interesting point to lecture. So external ethics is actually useful only if you can find out what are the rules which are being used to test for plagiarism so I can get around it and uh, ex exactly the criteria and so that I can learn how to get around the rules. So basically that's the point of a but internal ethics is completely different matter. It is driven by the heart. So can we achieve a kind of pursuit of knowledge where the ink of our pens will weigh more than the blood of the martyrs. This is really something worth striving for. If we are striving for the Akhirah, then it makes sense to try for that kind of learning which will, and, and we know that the kind of learning we are doing now, this is not going to count. Our ink is not going to be weighed like that because uh, there are certain standards which must follow. To arrive at this result. So Allah Ta'ala created Khalaqal Mawta Bal Hayat al Yabulukum Ayukum Asanu Amala. So life is a competition, but it is not for the one who earns the most money, but it is for the one who does the best deeds. And pursuit of knowledge has been praised so much that there are books and books and books about it. And so this is among the best of the deeds. And uh, part of the best deeds, the greatest deeds are the ones which uh, occur in very harsh and adverse circumstances. So in that sense then, a harsh and hostile environment is an advantage because it allows us to attain more reward for the deeds. And uh, teachers have the potential to change the lives of their students. So this brings the greatest rewards on the Day of Judgment, but also carries with it a great risk of uh, losing that chance and missing our potential and misguiding our students. And so ethics and integrity con considered within an economic Islamic framework is of greatest importance. But it has different meanings from what HEC uh, says. So, uh, focusing on our job as teachers and remember that the greatest teacher was our Prophet Muhammad وسلم, in the history of mankind. So teaching is a very, very honorable profession and uh, uh, Allah Ta'ala builds children with enormous amounts of capacity for learning and anybody who has watched an infant knows that in from one day to the next how much they learn and how amazing ways that they, they can integrate all of the knowledge around them into and and, uh, and put it together and come up with very deep conclusions so um, actually my um, lectures contain a lot of links uh, but in the end at, on the first slide there is a link to the whole lecture itself, the slides, so you don't need to copy all the links, you can just download the slides. So currently, our teaching methods stifle the creativity of the students and poison their minds. Instead of guiding them towards great success, which is what education is supposed to be, Fawzal Kabir, we guide them towards failure in this world and the next. It's because we are just doing imitation. We are uh, imitating the West in subject matter, in methodology, in motivating our students. So one very important book to read in this regard is this book by Julie Rubin called The Making of the Modern University, Intellectual Transformation and the Marginalization of Morality. So what's the central point of this book is that 
the definition of knowledge changed in early 20th century what does knowledge mean prior to the 1930s truth included both moral truths and scientific truths it's all one yani when you say that it is wrong to kill this is true statement and when you say that the stones fall at 9.8 meters per second squared this is also a true statement so and these are the same kind of truths but in 1930s there was a very sharp division and this philosophy of logical positivism said that the statement about gravity is true the statement about morality is meaningless noise because it cannot be empirically verified what is the data what is the regression you can run to prove that killing is wrong so if there is no data then it it is meaningless so basically um logical positivism drove the study of morality out of university so this is the basic point marginalization of morality that she says that before in the early 20th century if you look at college catalogs they will say our central purpose is to build character is to teach students how to be a good human being how to fulfill their social responsibilities as husbands as neighbors how to fulfill their civic responsibilities as as citizens and so on so this this is the purpose all other things are secondary but after the idea of what knowledge has changed this uh, was gradually abandoned until in the 1950s there is no mention of character and there is no even the goal so all we do is teach students technical skills we do not teach them how to be good human beings and obviously if we don't teach then what is the point of a lecture in ethics and morality if we are not uh, concerned with this there is a direct conflict between logical positivism which is at the foundation of all western knowledge all, all western knowledge in the 20th century yeah, there is that's been gradual change in the structure of knowledge and so the quran starts with uh alif lam mim zalik al kitab al arab fi hudal muttaqin alladhina yu'minuna bil ghaib so one of the characteristics of those who have taqwa and those who will receive guidance is that they believe in the unseen and logical positivism says exactly the opposite it says that we are the people who disbelieve in knowledge only about observations what we can see and touch so they are allazina yunkiruna bil ghaib so actually superficially it seems sensible that all knowledge comes to us from observations after all what else is there if we are blind we cannot see anything then we cannot get any knowledge about the world but actually um, observations are defined in a certain special way this logical positivism it is the development of thinking which emerged after the rejection of religion in europe and when they rejected god then they rejected the unseen and gradually they rejected everything which cannot be observed now so one of the things that happened as a result is that they rejected the inner world of human beings and we all understand this because we have studied that objective knowledge is very valuable subjective is meaningless worthless what does this mean subjective knowledge is my knowledge of what is inside me my heart my soul my feelings this is all subjective why is subjective because only i can know it you cannot know what i what is inside me and that's why they say it's not scientific nobody any yani objective is what everybody can agree on and subjective is my inner feeling and what they said is subjective knowledge causes fighting i believe strongly that protestantism is true he believes that catholicism is true and so we fight each other so forget about it. ignore subjective knowledge get rid of it but uh what they got rid of and they they still it is not a part of any any curriculum any syllabus what is the most important question that all of us face in our lives that is how should i live uh, more on a on a more uh, abstract way what is the meaning of life 
So, from the Islamic point of view, we know because we have been told, but that's really, that's also something that we have to decide and, uh, with using our reason and using our hearts. Is Islam the true religion? And is that how I should live? First, you have to decide that. So, is this the question of meaning of life? What should I do? I have only a small number of moments to live. And what is the best way I can use these moments? This is obviously the most important question for every single human being on this planet. But according to positivists, this is not even a question. Because it is a, the answer must be subjective. It depends on who I am. And these questions about what my internal states are, are not part of knowledge. So gradually, this question was dropped out. As opposed to the fact that for 2000 years, all philosophers and all religions have considered this to be the most important question and from Aristotle and so so Socrates and all of the ancient philosophers to many modern philosophers, this question has been the, where, where received a lot of significant discussion. So, the consequences of logical positivism, which we have all learned, we have all absorbed, this is the poison which we have all absorbed through our study of Western textbooks, because it's built into them. You don't, it, they don't actually even talk about, mention the word, it's just the foundation upon which Western knowledge is built. So, like the foundation of any building, it's underneath the ground, you don't see it, but all the knowledge that you get is built on this assumption. That knowledge is only about observables. What does it mean? Knowledge is only about external reality, the world outside us. There is no knowledge about inside, what is inside me. That is why we never talk in, uh, to our students about what is going on with you, what is your life like, how are you feeling, guide him on life decisions because this is not part of knowledge. Of course, actually, all of us actually do that because we are human beings and we know that there is more to life than what is written in the textbook. But the textbooks make no mention of it. And this is not the pattern by which we have been taught. So, uh, if we accept this premise of logical positivism, then we get to the idea that only what is observed uh, is knowledge. But what we can see, we can measure it somehow or the other. And if we can measure it, then we can reduce it to numbers. And so, data analysis will lead to complete knowledge about the world. Because, uh, and morality uh, is meaningless noise. We cannot measure honesty and integrity, and therefore, there is no point in discussing these things. This is just Now, the thing is that all of these ideas are false and are easily proven to be false. And in fact, logical positivism had a collapse in philosophers in the 1970s. Everybody realized that these ideas cannot be workable. But even though modern economics is built on positivism very explicitly and clearly, uh, they never went back and revised the foundations. And similarly, modern management is very strongly positivist, as is public policy. So, nearly all the disciplines are positivist, even though positivism has been proven wrong. So, one of the most famous maxims which is often quoted and which is responsible for a huge amount of damage to this world is that you cannot manage what you cannot measure. So, this leads to disastrous results. There is the Goodhart's law. If you try to take something which is measurable and make it into a performance measure, then this performance measure becomes meaningless noise. And this is an abstract uh, thing, but we all know it very clearly in practice, <clears throat> especially the older academics. The system of counting publications has not been there all the time and uh, it was done differently before. So, measures of academic performance have led to massive problems because people have just uh, created ways to game the system. They have created fake journals and fake articles and many ways to 
receive high publication counts and to receive high scores on the HEC index for institutional quality without actually doing any real improvement in quality. So the only real quality is actually a subjective measure. It cannot be seen. And so the real uh, methodology would be to subjectively evaluate the impact of research on real world. And there are ways to do that, but we are not trained to think along those lines. So I have a number of articles on how trying to measure some things which cannot be measured leads to a large amount of harm and damage. So college rankings and, and basically the critical insight which follows after you do a lot of different case studies that if you want to create an index number, it is completely subjective. And the, the strange thing is it looks subjective because you have a number, but actually you can make the numbers come out as you like. So in one of my trainings for my students in statistics, I say, okay, here are the HEC criteria um, and you are free to add uh, one or two more if you like. Uh, make this university come out to be the top university. And if you know how the game works, you can take any university and make it come out the top university. So this is just completely arbitrary. But once you set up the criteria, it, it looks very powerful and impressive and subjective. So basically, the consequence of all of this is positivism makes honest data. One of the one of the tasks that I was given was to explain how to do data analysis honestly with integrity. And what I would like to say is this is impossible. Because what logical positivism says is that all the information is in the data. This is not true. It is how you manipulate the data. So basically, for any data, there is a story you tell about the data, narrative. And the, it is the narrative which controls the interpretation of the data. I was taught the opposite in my PhD. I was told that in econometrics, we study the data and the data gives us the information. But after a long, long period of study and thought and realize this is not true. Uh, the data, given any data set, I can find a narrative which will create any meaning you want out of that data set. So the question is how, uh, how to construct, how to build narratives, but we are never taught this because we are all suffering from the illusion that it is the data that matters. It is not the data which matters. And due to the influence of positivism, we are unaware of the subject aspects. And there is a lot of mathematics which is done and the narrative is built into the mathematics unfortunately. So it's very um, obscure. It's not there on the surface. If I was telling a story, then you would understand that I am telling a story about the data and you would be able to see if the story is strong or weak. But when it's built into mathematics, okay, we have this regression model and the errors are IID. You have already told a story about the data, but now nobody understands what IID errors are say, actually saying about how the world works, but it actually it's an assumption about how the world works. So uh, just to illustrate, uh, there are two critical non-positivist concepts which are essential for data analysis and neither of them are uh, capable of being handled by, uh, data, by, by positivism. One of them is probability. A very simple idea of probability is that if I flip a coin and it comes up heads, probability 50% means that it could have come up tails in another world. But this is never observable. And that is why you have these ridiculous <coughs> probability deficients, <coughs> frequency theory, subjective probability, logical probability, and all of all of this is just ways to try to avoid saying things about the other world which you cannot see. So the natural definition of probability is blocked by positivism. And so 
we only confuse our students when we try to teach them probability because we cannot teach them the what is the obvious thing, uh, what is the obvious way of defining probability. The other thing which is even deeper and even more problematic is that causality cannot be observed. Only correlation can be observed. And so all the time in regression analysis we make assumptions about causality without realizing that we are doing so. And all the analysis based on assumptions not on data. But we think that what we are doing is objective and fact based. So I have given alternative definitions of probability which come up if you uh, abandon positivism. Two critical features of probability which are never mentioned in textbooks. One is that probability is one directional. Probability of future events exists, but for past events they have already occurred, the probability is either 1 or 0. Now there is a very famous Bayes rule which is in every textbook of probability. This rule is false simply because one direction of conditioning is going backwards and the other one is going forwards. So one in di one direction it makes sense and when you flip them around as you do in the Bayes rule then you get the wrong di time direction and probability doesn't make sense and that's why the Bayes rule is wrong. The other thing which doesn't <coughs> which is not mentioned in the text, again because of blinders of positivism, its probability is also conditional. There is an article by Mankiv about probability of recessions in which he calculates, okay, he looks at the last hundred of years of data and he says, okay, how many, uh, suppose that there were 13 years of recession and 100 years of <coughs> growth, then he says, okay, the probability of recession is 13 percent. All right, now that's, <coughs> that's an unconditional probability. But suppose we say, all right, now suppose that the, in the last year we had uh, high growth. Now what is the probability? Now you can go look like, at the data again and look at those cases in which there was high growth in the last year. But you can also say, okay, so what, what happens if there is population growth? What happens? So you, there are hundreds and thousands of events to condition upon. And each condition will lead to a different probability. And there is no way to actually uh, know what are the right events to condition on what are not. So again, uh, probability is always conditional, but we don't know what to condition on and that makes for a very uh, real and difficult problem to solve about probabilities when it comes to applications. But all of this is ignored in positivist theories. Much worse is the case of uh, <coughs> causality. So when we write down a regression equation y equals a plus b x plus error, then we are making an assumption that x is exogenous. What exogenous means is again has to do with causality. It means that there is no linkage from y to x. Basically causality runs only in one direction from x to y and there is no other chain y affects t affects s affects w affects y. So if there is a causal chain which goes from y to x, then you don't have exogeneity. But this is never explained to anybody uh, in any book and uh, people are always confused as to what exogeneity means. And again, causality is never explained. And so, uh, again, uh, textbooks don't have the correct definition. Why they don't have? Because uh, positivism makes it impossible because it's not in the data. It's causality is not in the data, it's in the narrative, the story you tell about the data. I could give examples, but um, this is not our topic. So I will uh, move on. But there are some very nice examples of how given the same set of data, a different story will uh, give a different causal interpretation to the data. So let me give one example. Uh, in the supply side model, capital and labor are exogenous and they determine the output y is equal to f of kl and then this is divided into a consumption part and a savings part and the savings part is always equal to the investment part. This is the demand side model works quite differently. 
So according to the demand side model, <coughs> uh, the production is determined by the demand. So people look at the consumer demand, which is actually an expectation. And when the producer is producing, he has to hire labor and, and uh, buy inputs. And he does so in anticipation of uh, consumer demand and also of investor demand for investment goods. So there is an expectation about the future uh, GNP and this forecast of the future demand for goods determines the level of production of consumer goods and the uh, and uh, income goods, uh, sorry, investment goods. And so the causal chains are different. And the regression models in, in, in this model would be different. Actually, uh, the e regression equation is wrong. C equals B Y A plus B Y consumption function doesn't work like that because investment demand determines is exogenous and that determines both consumption and income. And so the standard assumptions of the regression model are wrong because they don't take into account the right causal chains. Now the thing is that this cannot be determined because a lot of things are happening which are unobservable. The expectations are not observable and how the producers make their decisions is not directly observable. We see the decision but we don't need the reason for those decisions. So a lot of unobservable models, model, uh, variables are involved in arriving at understanding of what is exogenous and what is the causal chain. And so that depends on the story we tell about how production takes place in an economy. So uh, what are the implications? Coming back to my topic, what are the implications for research ethics? Well, basically external ethics leads to study of methods to get around these rules because there is no internal motivation. The, the only motivation for uh, following ethics is to avoid punishment. So instead of saying, okay, I, I, I should follow ethics because I don't want to get punished, say, how can I avoid getting punished? How can I avoid getting caught? And within positivism and positivist theories of knowledge, there is no basis for internal ethics. So, what are the internal ethics for research? Well, ethics is only possible using internal motivations for akhara, for our souls, for rewards, for pursuit of knowledge. But how can we do this when what we are teaching to our students is exactly the opposite of anything to do with the akhara? So in economics, we teach them directly kufr. We teach them that life is all about pursuit of pleasure. The rational man must maximize the pleasure he gets from goods and service. What does this have to do with Islam? Allah Ta'ala says, Lan birra hatta tunfaqumimma Do. So take the most precious possession and give it away for the sake of Allah. This is going to maximize utility or minimize utility. It's going to minimize utility. And lots of places where we are taught that if you uh, pursue your idle desires, you will go to Jahannam. And now economics is all about uh, any maximize your pleasure, pursue your idle desires. Management is all about pursuit of profits. And policy is about pursuit of maximum wealth. Well, policy has more uh, dimensions, but it's all uh, material goals. All of these are dramatically wrong lessons and they are dramatically in conflict with Islamic teachings. And so how can we uh, create uh, conformity, harmony? How can we teach our students to, how can we teach ourselves to pursue ethics when we are teaching the opposite things in our classes? So actually, um, all of this creates a golden opportunity for us because the dominant theories in the field of the social sciences and the research methods and the research itself is so bad that it's very easy to make a valuable contribution. 
and one of the reasons that uh, we do we find plagiarism and dishonesty is because of the feeling that we cannot make valuable contributions because uh, of two reasons one is that what i call the dazzle of western knowledge firan akar says jalwaye danish frank because it seems so bright and uh, powerful with all these mathematics and computers and that it seems like um, it's hard to and first of all you can't master it and even if you master it you can't make significant contributions and the other part which is also the complement of that is there is lack of self confidence for especially uh, our students all their lives they have been given material which is more or less indigestible impossible to understand so they have made a habit of copying and uh, and reproducing in exams and getting by and they have understood that real knowledge is impossible for me to understand so uh, it's a, it's not due to any lack on the part of our students but it is due to the nature of positivist knowledge that it is intrinsically useless <coughs> so the first lesson that i try to teach my students is that your lives are precious and that you can achieve whatever you want to achieve and so one of the critical determinants of success is our ambition and also the teachers expectations from the student if we expect all our students to be failures they will be failures but if we expect all of them to be superstars they will become superstars and so since laysa lil insani illa ma sa so if they aim for the stars then they will reach the stars but if they don't then they will have very mediocre careers so one of the things is that uh, to overcome the dazzle of western knowledge which is what i have been doing so there was a time in history of islam when muslims were overly impressed by greek knowledge and so the mutazila argued that greek knowledge is more uh, more valuable than the quran and so the great contribution of imam ghazali was to put greek knowledge in its place and he wrote this book called tahafut al falasfa in which he basically uh, blew greek philosophy to pieces today we are faced with the modern mazila and the whole umma with very few exception believes that the knowledge created by the west over the past 3 centuries is superior to the quran at least by actions because we are investing all our time learning western knowledge and very little time learning our own intellectual heritage so this is a illusion western knowledge is not as powerful and strong as it appears so i am going to uh, skip to uh, all of these topics which i have mentioned briefly have very long explanations and i just uh, because there is lots of arguments which can be given from both sides now i am going to switch to a uh, pragmatic ideas what are the things we can do uh, instead of philosophy, high philosophy so basically um, one of the things that we need to do is to stop uh criticizing weaknesses stop looking at weaknesses instead uh build on strengths so when we do that initially it seems like there is nothing there we only see weaknesses we only see strengths of the west and we see only weaknesses but there is a lot of good things if you if you are close your eyes to the brilliance of western knowledge then eventually you learn to see there is lots of good things in our students so once you understand the nature of knowledge which is different from positivist knowledge then you learn to see that pursuit of knowledge is intrinsically rewarding it doesn't require that 
other people will pay you money, then you will do research. It's so rewarding and very interesting that um, somebody who was doing an empirical study he said that all of the people that I met who were successful, I found one character. Some days they would say they said that we would be so excited about the things that we had to do, about the knowledge that we had to pursue that uh, we would not be able to sleep uh, in the excitement and anticipation. We'd get up early and start working because it was too difficult to fall asleep because of the excitement. So this is the true knowledge. So now, if we shift our knowledge paradigm, and that is what I am asking for in this, that instead of following the positivist paradigms, let us follow Islamic paradigms, even though the, then this will cause a lot of damage because everything that we have learnt becomes suspect. Maybe there are some good things in it, maybe there are some bad things, but uh, Islam offers a lot of different ideas. How are we going to, we haven't been trained in this direction. So, uh, the style of pedagogy that we have learnt is the expert and ignoramus model where the teacher stands as the authority and the students are uh, so this in this model if we are going to be uncertain if we are going to be seekers of knowledge ourselves <coughs> along with the students then we cannot use this model and it causes lots of harm because if the student asks the question we say i don't know then that damages our authority. But if we go to the fellow traveler model, look, what I have learned in these books is very much in conflict with Islam and I am trying to develop a new understanding and let's all learn together. Then you can say, oh yeah, that's a very good question. I don't know the answer to that. Let's look it up. And let's uh, tomorrow come back and we will discuss our findings. So, uh, epistemic arrogance is the characteristic of Western knowledge. We know the truth, and anybody who is different uh, is false. Epistemic humility, maybe I am right, maybe you are right. This is the best of my, to the best of my knowledge, this is the right view. But if somebody comes up with a better uh, understanding, let him follow that instead of my view, which is weak. I am just a human being. So, <laughs> if we get a taste for knowledge, then we can impart the excitement of learning to our students. But if we have never tasted ourselves, then we cannot. So, in order to get that, we have to distinguish between useful and useless knowledge. This distinction does not exist in Western approaches to knowledge because all knowledge is the same. What is useful and useless? Basically, this depends on the goal of life. Our goal is ma'arifat of Allah, learning to recognize God. So, useful knowledge is that which helps us to achieve our goals. Now, if there is no goal of life, then there is no way to differentiate between useful and useless life uh, and knowledge. One of the things that the Prophet ﷺ told us about useful knowledge is that enters the heart. Which means that it is subjective. So, and which means that it relates to our life experiences and it changes the lives. So, uh, that's why basically positivist uh, knowledge is poisonous because it doesn't touch the heart. It touches only the head and the heads are not useful in terms of. So, uh, logical positivism, knowledge of external reality, Islam is all about knowledge of our internal world and basically one of the key assertions why we think that western knowledge is superior is because of not the knowledge itself but a claim about the knowledge that this is the only valuable knowledge the only valuable knowledge is the knowledge of external reality and the the, the evidence for this is look we are ruling the world we are the power and we have the wealth so allah ta'ala says that look this world is only temporary. Fir'aun ruled the world and Namrud had lots of wealth 
and Qairun had enormous amounts of wealth. These people were not successful. So, the, the fact that somebody has knowledge that can give him wealth and power, this is not evidence that this is useful knowledge. The real success is the success on the Day of Judgment. So, uh, if we understand this, then we can resist the power and then really, and we can argue and we can understand that the most important call, kind of knowledge is the one which leads us, uh, teaches us how we can lead better lives. One of the consequences of logical positivism, which is very relevant to our current discussion, is that uh, because they only study external reality, they have very hopelessly bad models of human behavior. In economics, the human is a robot. He is, his behavior is subject to mathematical formula. This is not true of any human being. This is just a bad model. So, one of the problems is that human societies are not governed by laws of science. So, this whole term social science is wrong uh, in the sense that what they did was that science has been very successful. We can follow the uh, laws of gravity and the planets move in regular orbits. But societies, they evolve and change continuously and every day change is happening. If you look at Ibn Khaldun and his study of society, which is the first actual study of history, in which he, he studies, all right, so we want to study the dynamics of social change. How do societies evolve and change over time? Now, this question cannot be considered within the framework of social science because the science means that there is a law and this law governs the behavior of societies in all time and across space and across cultures, which is simply ridiculous. I mean, this uh, is a fundamental error. The idea that the economics of the USA is applicable to economics of Pakistan is just ridiculous. Their theories and their situation is very different from our situation and, our, and the theories that we need for us. So this science concept that there is one universal law which ap applies across time and space, this has been a very, very big bottleneck in our terms of our developing our understanding of our own society because we unthinkingly apply laws which were developed on the basis of the experience of European societies. So, the fact that these models of behavior are toxic has now been recognized in the West quite widely. And lots of people are saying this and they are trying to do something about it. <clears throat> the foundation of all social science, social science is the study of human society, must be the study of human behavior. Now, the fact is that even the, 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 the worst models which we have in economics and in management that firms are seekers of profit and, and uh, humans are seekers of, of uh, pleasure, these are wrong models. But even their best models are not very good. And uh, we have made over the past few decades Tremendous progress in Islamic psychology. So there is a diploma in Islamic psychology at Cambridge and uh, a number of programs in Islamic psychology and a number of textbooks. And um, so a lot of progress is made. If we make this the foundation stone, we can rebuild social sciences from scratch on based on an Islamic theory of human behavior. And an Islamic theory of human behavior is not confined to Muslims only. It says that human beings have egos and nafs and ruh. The nafs pulls towards evil, the ruh pulls towards good. So actually the economic theory, of modern microeconomic theory is pure theory of nafs ammara, the lowest degree of spiritual progress. What is nafs ammara? nafs ammara does what the desire commands it to do. And this is exactly what economic theory says, that if you desire to do something, then you should do it. That will maximize your utility. Now, nafs lawama says that, no, don't do it. <laughs> uh, this might cause harm. This might cause damage and so on. And nafs-e-mutmainna is much higher stage. So, anyway, 
So the point that I wanted to make here is that Islamic psychology is not about the behavior of Muslims. It, uh, there, there's ruh, there's nafs, there's aql, and there is uh, qalb. So these are four dimensions of humans. And uh, so some, uh, the, uh, the aql derives the calculation, the rational part, and the qalb derives the emotion part. And what the business people, uh, there, are, there are theories of consumer behavior, uh, with, with book with exact title, Theory of Consumer Behavior, taught in the economics department and taught in the business department. The economic theory says that human beings maximize utility, they do it rationally. The business theory book uh, says that we, st we studied these economic theories and they're nonsense, they, they don't work. Human beings are, are, are driven by their emotions. And so you want to sell things, attract, appeal to the heart of the person, don't appeal to his mind. So, uh, the, uh, na, and the Islamic psychology says that both aql and qalb play a role in the decision making. So, where does the excitement of the pursuit of knowledge come from? It is when you understand the power of knowledge. And so, uh, today, tiny minorities govern the world because all of us agree to their rule. And how do we agree? This consent is created by controlling the knowledge that we have. <laughs> We have all been teaching theories which we know to be absurd and ridiculous. Any, any microeconomics theory uh, teacher who walks into the world, he knows that this old lady, when she is, pursue, uh, she is, uh, she is uh, purchasing one kilo of apples, she doesn't have a utility function. She doesn't have partial derivatives. She doesn't know how to do the calculus to calculate the first order conditions to show that uh, one kilo of apples will maximize her utilities. This is just absurd. But we are teaching these theories, even though we know that this is not, we, we never calculate our utility, we never maximize. My wife has told me to bring me three kilos of potatoes, I'll go and buy three kilos. I'll not calculate my utilities. So we know uh, my utility is tied to making sure that my wife gets what she wants. <laughs> so, uh, how is it that we have been browbeaten into teaching falsehood? This is because of power. And so, we can reverse this because Allah Ta'ala changed the world by giving insan uh, the world changed by an ilm that was given to man which they didn't have. Today, Muslims in the world, vast majority believe that today we are in ignorance and darkness because we don't have western knowledge, not because we haven't studied the Quran. The Quran actually changed the world. It came to the ignorant and backwards Muslims. They were at the bottom of the hierarchy and all the nations, there was Roman Empire and uh, uh, then uh, Persian Empire and Chinese Empire and many uh, advanced civilizations on the planet and the Arabs were the most backwards but this ilm it made them into leaders of the world and it created a civilization which enlightened the world with knowledge for a thousand years so this was a very powerful knowledge that was given to Muslims so what happened is it all gone? Has it disappeared? Has this knowledge have no value today? Knowledge has the same value today, but we Muslims are not looking towards that knowledge. We are looking towards the West for our guidance today. So, Iqbal says that hum to mail be karam hai koi sail hi nahi, rah dekhlaayin ke se reh rave manzili nahi. Today we are not asking Allah what we should do, we are asking the West. Harvard expert will tell us how to run our economics. So the Western social sciences are built on logical positivism and therefore they are built on the wrong foundations. They have the wrong theory of human behavior. They have the wrong methodology for data analysis and they have the wrong understanding of the sources of human well-being. So we teach our students that if you get pleasure from, maximize pleasure from goods and consumptions, you will be happy. But this is not true. Human happiness does not depend on consumption. It depends on our social relationships, whether uh, in the hadith it is that 
the moment loves and is loved so being loved and loving these are the sources and on character on shukr on certain uh, on on being having fortitude in the face of trials and and many other uh, characteristics which these are the sources of happiness and this has been established by secular scientists also so once we understand this one very important pragmatic conclusion is that all of the papers the best papers that are being written on the basis of these foundations are wrong so we can improve upon them so i just as a exercise i looked at the top 3 articles i today this has become very easy you can look at chat gpt and uh, find out and there are many other sources what are the top most highly cited articles in econ which were written from 1915 to 1920 because i wanted to give it a five year window to percolate if you look at the most recent article it won't be highly cited because that's where you want to, if you want to st- uh, do research let's pick something where uh, which is very popular and see why uh, how we can improve so the first article <clears throat> this is very interesting because uh what it says is that economic theory says that uh, if we uh, follow free trade policies then maybe our industry will collapse due to importation uh, to imports but our laborers will find a job in a more efficient industry where we have comparative advantage so this didn't happen the china shock when chi- we allowed chinese goods to come in many of our industries collapsed unemployment rose and there was no compensating they didn't find they didn't find employment in better industries so this is a very uh, good finding and now we can uh, because this uh, this uh, idea is very against mainstream so we can look for uh, uh, its uh, parallels in uh, our own industry we have had so many collapsed industries let's study collapsed industries in pakistan and see why that happened and see the role that economics bad economics played in it which we can find i mean people were persuaded by imf and world bank to lower our import barriers and uh, this lowering led to collapse of domestic industry and it has led to a non productive pakistan the second one is a uh, impact of covid uh, on small business so actually there's a very interesting yani we can also study impact of uh, covid on small business and uh, we can apply insights from our own uh, traditions and our own society this is the thing that we uh, can uh, in in when it comes to research one has to be pragmatic this is one of the problems with my students that they say that oh, everything is wrong so if you say that then that in the defense um, you get attacked very strongly because everybody sitting on the table has used those theories so you have to be pragmatic when you uh, so that's why you have to take a small piece and say okay everything else is correct but this small piece i would like to make a change in so try to choose a topic which will have um, high impact the case and deaton article is very interesting because it explains uh, that in the usa <clears throat> if you look at life expectancies one uh, one uh, one population group where we don't expect it to go down is the white middle class where they are reasonably well off and they are not they are, they are in the means to see right but the thing is that the mortality has been declining and when you study the figures closely you see that mostly it has to do with suicide or suicidal lifestyles you take so many drugs that you die uh, you you drive drunken and uh, so basically why are uh, well off whites committing so much suicide that the life expectancy has gone down it's because the life has become meaningless because they don't find any satisfaction because the what they are teaching in the west which we are following is that life is all about pursuit of pleasure 
But when you pursue pleasure and when there are no barriers to pleasure, you find that pleasure is a meaningless pursuit. It's only attractive to those who are uh, restrictive and, uh, and tied up and can't pursue. It seems like you know, the grass is greener on the other side. But when you actually open up the other fence and you go to the other side, you find that there is nothing there. So then when you say that there is nothing there and, and the culture says this is all there is, then you become suicidal. Uh, so they, they don't have any concept of higher pursuits of life. Pursuit of pleasure is all there is and if it doesn't bring satisfaction, then suicide becomes the only option. So what I'm saying is that we have a lot of ways in which we can make significant contributions to research because even the best papers being produced in the West are uh, full of holes and errors and problems. So uh, the goal of our supervision should be to increase our knowledge and to increase the knowledge of the student. So uh, one of the standard ways for PhD supervisions is that we should uh, uh, ask our student, this is actually part of formal PhD requirements in some places that read 150 articles on your topic of interest and summarize them. And today this has become enormously easy. Uh, you can uh, create a list of topics uh, using uh, chat GPT. You can say, okay, okay, this is my topic, give me 150 articles. Then you can actually go through the articles with chat GPT and you can say, okay, okay uh, here's the article, teach me what it says. And you can go through it paragraph by paragraph. Um, Here, there is a very critical distinction which uh, our students don't have and it takes a lot of effort to get through this. It is uh, the difference between acquiring knowledge and copying. So if, we, I, if I wanted to, I, if, I, if I wrote to ChatGTP that I have a seminar to present on uh, research and integrity, so it could write out the whole essay and prepare the, all the slides. but. It would be nothing original in it. and I would not learn anything from it. It would just be a, a charba of what is going on in latest articles pieced piece together in some random way which, had, which would have exactly its artificial intelligence. It would look like it would have a semblance of intelligence but actually there is no intelligent thought behind it. So um, students are trained to copy, they have been uh, uh, paralyzed into thinking that they cannot learn, they cannot acquire knowledge. So uh, getting them to use chat GPT in a useful way which adds to knowledge instead of a harmful way in which the uh, thing produces the paper and they don't understand what is written by the output. That's a very difficult job and uh, it can be done. It requires a lot of hand holding. And, but if you, um, if you can go for quick wins, that is, see, teach the students in a way that they s understand that uh, we are learning things and they taste the excitement of learning, then uh, it, uh, this, can, this can come about. That learning consists of small steps. Every day we learn something. Regardless of what there is, if you want to be Einstein, it's not that you have to be enormously intelligent. It is that there is a particular subject matter which consists of 3000 units of knowledge. If you learn one, one new unit every day, at the end of 3000 days you will know what Einstein said and you will know why that was wrong and why it was improved upon. It's not, no, there's nothing, any, it's not that you need brains, it's just you need perseverance and you need a guide who will give you the right 3000 steps. The problem, the reason students fail is that we are giving them 10 steps to do at one time and then they can't take that longer step and so they fall and fail. And then that's where chat GTP is useful. It can break out, break down a lesson into small pieces and present it. This was actually something that any good teacher could do, but we don't have time to do it. We have 30 students and we understand that this guy doesn't understand anything. And if I gave him a one-to-one -one lesson, uh, and I spent six hours, he would understand, but I don't have time. And there are 30 students, they are all different. So, uh, 
uh, regardless of what happens, we are forced to leave behind some students and we have to cater to only the median. But today we have an opportunity. So, uh, one of the things that uh, I'm coming to the end, I think also of time, <laughs> but my slides also, that models, mathematical models are just stories we make up about the data. Mathematical data analysis is a set of false assumptions which we impose upon the data which nobody understands because the assumptions are phrased in a language which few people understand. We can make up better stories about the data by thinking about how the real world works and how humans behave. And we can do better data analysis by using certain techniques which have now become available, which are not uh, available, which were not available earlier. So one of the uh, insights which is especially useful for economists is that a lot of models are just built on wrong mathematics. Actually, the critical thing is that uh, the mathematics currently in use is not suitable for the study of human behavior because the most advanced macro model available today is called the DSGE, Dynamic Stochastic General Equilibrium. It's currently in use for monetary policy around the globe. And the thing is that it has only one agent, one human being in the whole economy. Why? Because if you put in two agents, then the model becomes too complicated to solve. So the thing is, this is stupid because uh, this was valid 50 years ago when we didn't have computers. You can't solve, you can, then you can't do anything. But today the computers can solve the model, but we are stuck in a, uh, in a tradition which doesn't recognize that computing capabilities have increased. So there is a counter strategy. If we make complex theories about the world, we can use complex models. Simulation models are very easy to build and understand. And uh, when these were first came out, they were very fashionable. Economists thought that we will use these to prove our theories. But then they became sidelined because when you started using these models, you found out that all of the mainstream theories were wrong. And so they quietly shunted them to the side and the corner. So evolutionary ABM models provide a new paradigm for research. And the reason I mention this is because when you do PhD research, then you need to have some mathematics. Conventional mathematics doesn't work, but simulation models are very easy to make, to understand, to explain, and they provide a, a strong mathematical foundation for any theory that you want. And we have a lot of very complex theories of human behavior, which we can introduce, which are, don't exist in the literature, and which we can introduce by thinking about how human beings actually behave. So basically human beings have hearts and souls and this is, uh, if we introduce this, we will get a new paradigm for business, a new paradigm for economics. And so these are concluding remarks. Ethics and in integrity are part of our heart and soul. And uh, these are byproducts. One doesn't really have to look to ethics and integrity. One doesn't have to define it, explain it. If we say that we are searching for haq, then automatically this will happen. And the highest truth is God and the highest form of knowledge is Ma'rifat. And so how can we achieve Ma'rifat of God by uh, studying economics or management? Well, the first thing to do is to change our intention. We study economics in order to serve humanity and we do management. Uh, we change the model of business. Instead of providing services and goods to make profits, we earn profits in order to be able to provide services. So this is a reversal of the Friedman's model. And uh, when we serve the family of God, then Allah, this, then we will become the most loved of Allah. This is the, uh, uh, this is a Sahih Hadith. And uh, now the problem is that if you um, make the intention to serve mankind, then the shaitan will say that if you do that, you will starve to death. So Allah tells you, don't worry about him. <laughs> I'll take care of you. The truth is a very powerful instrument of change. And Allah Ta'ala promises to protect us from the shaitan and from faqr if we uh, 
um, decide to serve him. So this is the last slide and uh, it gives the link further. These slides where all of the material linked above is mentioned. So that's all. Our topic is research ethics and integrity. Uh, 